Okay, it's noon on the dot. We're getting started. Hi, everybody. I am Melissa Garcia, and I'm really excited, as always, to be presenting a webinar today. And this today is going to be for discrimination, seven examples. So a little bit of housekeeping first. Um, again, I'm Melissa Garcia. And on your screen, for those of you who haven't been um, on one of our webinars before, on your screen, you're going to see the PowerPoint presentation in the center. And this should take up most of your screen. Then there should also be a small box on the bottom right hand side of the screen with the video feed, i.e. the presenter me. On the left side of the menu, please select the questions and answers icon and type all your questions there, which will be addressed at the end of the webinar. CMCA credits are automatically generated once the webinar hosting site provides an attendance confirmation report and will be sent via email within 48 hours following the webinar. These credits are not transferable. So please email education at altitude law, altitude law or call Sean directly at 303-991-2076 if you have any questions about receiving your CMCA. Also upcoming webinars, April 15th, now this is a big one. Uh, everybody's talking about swimming pools and vaccines and all that good stuff. So we have Alina that's gonna be teaching 2021 pool season is almost here. So what's the deal this year? Sign up for the next webinar and you'll find out and Alina will tell you. Again, it's April 15th at noon. So be sure to stick around for that one. Um, and also, well, first, really quickly, I wanna say that we're, we're talking about a number of, of examples of discrimination, number seven. And, um, you know, the, these, these examples, are, I mean, each one of these examples could take up an entire webinar. So I just wanted to say that uh, we're, we're kind of doing an overview of some of the most common forms of discrimination examples that we that arise in at least my neighborhood um, and the kinds of common questions and things you should be thinking about if you have a question about discrimination. So that's the first thing. The second thing I wanted to make sure that you knew that if, if you again, if you haven't been to one of our webinars, now we record them. So even if one of your colleagues can't attend today, make sure that you check our YouTube channel and subscribe. If you subscribe, the video videos will be uploaded and you'll see them a little you know, tickler saying, hey, there's a new video. So subscribe to our Altitude Community Education YouTube channel, ACE YouTube channel, and that way you'll be able to review the, the recordings again, or if you missed one, take a look at one, and then finally, after this webinar, there's a, there's a bunch of great resources that we have on our website that address this topic. So even though I'm just doing an overview today, I'm gonna go ahead and send some of those resources, a couple of articles and other resources to you after the webinar as well, uh, so that you can have them for, for, for further review. All right, I think that's it. Did everything right, did all the housekeeping and everything right. So let's go ahead and get started discrimination in general. So I'm sure that at one point or another, you've either had a discrimination claim filed against you, hopefully not, or at least been threatened with one. Um, and, you know, it's either because of some violation of the Fair Housing Act, or maybe some Colorado law. And in some cases, maybe not with you, but in some cases, discrimination is obvious. But in most cases, when it comes to our, you know, um, firm, Usually the association is sort of surprised, the board is sort of surprised when faced with a discrimination complaint because they're saying, well, wait a minute, I did everything right. I followed all the governing documents. Um, I, I, you know, I had, maybe I, rev I wrote regs, rules and regs and I kind of looked at them and, and, and I did everything right. Why am I being, uh, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing towards the governing documents. And the thing is that sometimes the discrimination again is not obvious and it's often because the board didn't know that they were doing something wrong. They didn't know, for example, that a particular rule or reg was against um, statute, one of the statutory discrimination uh, provisions. Or maybe they didn't know that they were supposed to provide some kind of an exception to a rule or regulation based on um, some protected category. So oftentimes it's because you know, the board just doesn't know. 
And the consequences of discrimination, whether you knew or not, they could be severe. There's There could be a lot of penalties, um, pretty hefty fines in some cases, and I'll name a few when we go through the program today. Um, so it's really important for boards to understand and identify the ways that an association could discriminate. So it can take preventive steps to make sure that it doesn't get into that hot water to prevent the claims from happening in the first place. So first, let's talk about the relevant statutes. When we're discussing discrimination, we're looking at both federal law and state law, but most often we're really looking at the Federal Fair Housing Act which is codified there at 42 USC 3601. That just that's just the the citation for the provision, and um, that was initially initially enacted in 68, but then it was amended in 1988. Yeah, 1988 uh, to add a couple of protected categories. But basically, it makes it unlawful for housing providers, which includes associations, to discriminate based on certain protected categories, which we'll discuss in the next slide. The Colorado Civil Rights Act um, is pretty much the same. It protects against discrimination, but it's the statutory version, and it actually adds a few additional protected categories, which is the next slide. And so you should know also that there's two different enforcers of um, the discrimination, anti-discrimination statutes, and that's um, HUD, so the Department of Housing and Urban Development. That uh, entity enforces and administers um, the Fair Housing Act. And then the CCRD, which is the Colorado Civil Rights Division, does the same with respect to the Colorado anti-discrimination provisions. So what exactly is discrimination? Well, it says it right there on the screen. It's treating individuals differently with respect to sale, rental, or use of a dwelling based on one of the following protected categories. And you'll see that some say state only, which means that's Colorado only. But for example, for Fair Housing Act, uh, the categories that are protected are race, color, religion, sex, including sexual harassment, national origin. And then in 1988, it was amended to add handicap dis slash disability, familial status. Those are the bolded ones because those are added later. And those are the ones that I'm really going to be discussing today because those are the types of discrimination that associations face most. And familial status means ch uh, families with children. So that's what that means. It just means families with children. Discrimination is happening to families with children. So Colorado is the same as the Fair Housing Act. It protects all of those categories, but it adds creed, marital status, ancestry, and sexual orientation. I did want to bring up for the sexual orientation, there was a bill that was dra dropped, um, introduced uh, this year, HB 21 1108. And so if you get on our website, you'll see a legislative tracker that we always update with all the new legislative efforts and bills uh, regarding HOAs. And that new bill, HB 21 1108, was introduced and it amends the definition of sexual orientation and adds definitions of the terms gender expression and gender identity. And it adds those terms to those statutory provisions that prohibit discrimination. So just know that that's, that's a bill that's been introduced. It hasn't been signed into law yet or anything, but keep an eye on our legislative tracker and you'll see um, what happens to that bill. Okay, there's also two types of discrimination that you should understand under both uh, Fair Housing Act and the Colorado statutes as well. There's disparate treatment. And what that means is the victim of the discrimination is treated differently than others in the community based directly, they're directly based on their class. So for example, if you had a rule that said, um, everybody is allowed, everybody can register and use and rent and everything, the clubhouse except Asians. Asians aren't allowed. So that's a direct discrimination against Asians based on that rule. So it's, it's right there on the face. The second type is disparate impact. Now, what that means is the rule itself is facially neutral. So on the face, it seems neutral, but it has the effect of discriminating against a particular protected category. So for an example, 
no tricycles allowed. So who uses tricycles most of the time? <laughs> children. So families with children are directly impacted by that rule, even though on the face, it doesn't say anything about children. It just says no tricycles, but it has that effect. So what if you had a rule that said, or a covenant that said, no attorneys can live in the association? <laughs> so um, much as I'd love for attorneys to be a protected category, they are not. So on, already, it's not one of the protected categories uh, from discrimination. So yeah, you can, if you really hate attorneys that much, you can go ahead and exclude them. I heard that there was some kind of, um, I never actually saw the case, but I heard in California that there was an association that actually amended their documents, their, their covenants, to prohibit attorneys from living there. And, and I believe it was um, upheld. <laughs> so anyway, I'm not lobbying for that kind of, uh, or I'm not, uh, I would lobby for <laughs> a protected category for attorneys. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump right into the specific case studies of discrimination. Again, I'm gonna talk about seven of them. And these are real cases. Uh, there's a ton of cases out there. And I just picked a few that, you know, some cases are just very clear that they're discrimination. And I wanted to pick some that um, had a little bit more in them, that, whether it's a fact pattern or whether it's something that um, m might seem relatable to a lot of associations when I hear their uh, questions about discrimination. So again, there's tons of them, but we'll talk about seven. So number one, the case, and these are the two swimming pool case examples, the case of the noisy children. Um, so here we have a California association that has three swimming pools and there's a main one and then there's two auxiliary pools. And there's a gym, a gym, a clubhouse and a bunch of rec recreational facilities throughout the community. <clears throat> so there's no supervision in either the pool or any of the areas, the gym or the, the clubhouse. And in bold, children under 18 were prohibited in the main pool area. So, you know, protected category, families with children, because it's very clear and direct, children under 18 weren't allowed. And uh, when it went, went through the court process, because of course somebody sued, uh, the association said, well, we prefer, as their justification, we prefer the relative tranquility of a swimming pool, pool that's not filled with active and noisy children. So the court said, well, huh, they didn't buy that, of course. The desire for peace and quiet, while a worthy goal, is not valid justification for denying access to common area facilities on the basis of family status. So of course this was clear discrimination and the rule was struck down. So the other thing I wanted to discuss though that wasn't really on this, isn't on this fact pattern but comes up all the time is that the association also had rules that prohibited children under 15 from entering the clubhouse, which included all these other facilities like a gym, a sauna, a steam room and all that. And the association said that there, this was as a response to acts of vandalism, and it also was for safety reasons. So they're pushing the safety angle. You know, I mean, it might not be safe for kids to be using this equipment or to be in the steam room or, or what have you. So the safety exception was raised. That's key because that's the one exception that we found that associations might be able to adopt rules that limit families with children because of safety. So although generally pools that discriminate um, or that treat families with children differently than other residents uh, are dis found discriminatory, one exception is if the rule is, number one, rooted in compelling business necessity, and number two, constitutes the least restrictive means to achieve the desired effect. So for example, keeping a pool safe is obviously a compelling business necessity. So boards will often draft rules that say, okay, uh, no minors or nobody under 18 from using the pool without adult supervision. This comes up all the time. However, um, the rule must be reasonably limited to achieve the purpose of protecting the safety of its residents. So there ha it has to be reasonably limited. So in one case, the association had a typical rule that I see all the time that prohibits children under 18 from using the pool without a parent or guardian. 
And the court found that this violated the act because it was overly restrictive. Under that rule, you could have a 17 year old who was a certified lifeguard that couldn't be at the, couldn't swim alone. So the less restrictive means that could achieve the same safety goal was to require persons without swimming skills to be accompanied by a person with swimming skills, regardless of age. And that's what the, the court said in that case. And I also know that um, in another case, a more defensible number or age would be 14 uh, versus 18. And in that case, it was a California case. And what they said was 14 was more defensible because they it was a California uh, building code that essentially said uh, when, when there's no lifeguard that's on duty, then there should be a no lifeguard on duty sign. And the sign should also state that uh, children under the age of 14 shall not use the pool without a parent or gar adult guardian in attendance. So they were is more defensible because the age was, first of all, in this con California uh, construction code. And it also was more, again, related to the safety aspect of it, since there was no lifeguard on duty versus the age. So just something to keep in mind. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up really quickly is in this case, in the Landsman case, they also said even there might be some neutral restrictions on the face, but they might actually have the effect of resulting in an adult only swim scenario, and that's lap swim. So if you have lap swim time, that at least in this case and a number of other cases ha has been said is okay. So lap swim is okay. All right. That's case number one for swimming pool. Case number two. So those of you who um, <laughs> have watched Caddyshack, uh, and I'm dating myself, I know, uh, probably will understand with it, the name of the case of the potential floating baby roof. Um, this, and you'll understand this after reading this fact pattern. Well, this is the Florida Association, HUD versus Paradise Gardens. And what this association did was it prohibited children outright under the age of five from using the swimming pool just outright and then restricted children between 5 and 16 from using the pool from 11 a.m to 2 p.m each day due, due to the possible threat of fecal material in the pool hence the baby ruth reference so it's similar to the other one this is a protected category is families with children and rules that prohibit children from attending or being at the rec facility is the same as denying equal access to families with children than everybody else. So it is a discriminatory rule. This is similar to the other one, but I wanted to bring it up because this is, um, again, when in the other case we talked about the justification was that safety. Well, here, what the association was arguing was that the justification was sanitation and, and you know, fecal matter in the pool. And the concern was sanitation, which is obviously another compelling business necessity. And that's often cited as rationale. But forbidding non-toilet trained children, which is usually what we see are minors under a certain age, from using the pool altogether would violate the act because it's it's not the least, again, it's not the least restrictive means of achieving the goal of keeping a pool sanitary. So instead, at least in this case, the, the court said the goal could be achieved by requiring all non-toilet trained persons to wear waterproof pants. So that's, that's an example. Um, and I don't know if it was an example for this association, but that's an example that has been found okay. It's non-toilet trained persons can who can who have to wear waterproof pants. So it's not talking about children, um, and it's not uh, facially um, discriminating against children either. But it's still achieving the goal with a uh, lesser restrictive means. So in this case, the HUD, HUD did reject the association's argument. It was based on testimony. And the testimony from was from an environmental specialist who testified that there is no health reason to exclude children of any age from a pool and that the pool can be maintained in a healthful and clean condition, regardless of the ages of those who use the pool. They, she further testified it regarding incidents of human waste in pools of all adult health clubs, gross, 
and that there's no correlation between the age of swimmers and the sanitary level of a pool. Again, double gross. So the association received a fine. It was a $7,000 fine for violating the Fair Housing Act. This was way back in 1992, so who knows what that would be today, but it was $7,000. And another, uh, in another case, HUD found a rule prohibiting all small children um, from, that were not fully pot, pot trained from entering or being carried into the pool as a violation of the act as well. And they required them to change the rule to state the following. Any person who is incontinent or not fully potty trained must wear appropriate waterproof clothing when entering or being carried into the pool. So again, a lesser restrictive means to achieve the same goal of keeping the pool clean. Okay, so I'm done with the swimming pool cases. Let's move on. So the next case, and this is a Colorado case, so she, you should pay attention to this one. Double D Manor Inc. versus Evergreen, and this has been around for quite some time. This was back in 1989. And, um, in this one, it's a Colorado, Double D was a Colorado nonprofit corporation which provides a home life situation for development, developmentally disabled persons between ages of five and 21. And here, the, the covenants contain the following restriction. All sites shall be for residential use only with only one single family dwelling permitted on any site. Okay, so the protected category here again is disabled people not again, but here's new, is disabled individuals. And typically when we discuss uh, disabled individuals, when we're talking about the Fair Housing Act, we're, we're talking about um, an HOA having to provide a reasonable accommodation or a reasonable modification uh, to help the disabled person have an equal use of the community and their unit, but which we will talk about in the next couple of cases. But here, uh, even though it was it, 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 the, the facts concerned a group home with disabled kids. The case is more about how the court, uh, which was the Colorado Supreme Court, interpreted specific terms in the covenants, which then led to the result of allowing a group of disabled individuals to live in the community when otherwise they, they may not because of the covenants. So it was the way they interpreted the covenants. So here, again, we have an association that requires sites to be used for residential use. And we have a group home, which is arguably a business. Um, they have employees that live on site and they have staff that need to be paid. So there are wages that are being uh, paid. There are other costs for maintaining the business or the group home. So maybe it's commercial and that's sort of what the association argued. Also, it says that the site um, can only have one single family dwelling permitted on the site. So here's a group of seven kids who were all unrelated and they were unrelated to any of the staff members that were living there as well. So is this really a single family dwelling? Is it a single family living in the unit dwelling? So that's what the arguments posed by the association were in this case. And what did the Supreme Court state? So first of all, single family dwelling, they took care of that initially. And they said just based on the plain language of the sentence, single fam family dwelling describes the type of structure permitted and not the type of use that can be made on the property. So it's all sites again shall be used for residential use only with only one single family dwelling permitted on the site. So they were saying essentially that the single family was uh, modifying dwelling. They were, it wasn't talking about what's, who's living in the unit or who is you know, on the site, but it modified the actual dwelling. So what we're talking about is it has to be a structure, structurally for a single family, not who is living in the dwelling, but the type of structure for many. So then the second one was residential use. And here, you know, uh, the, the court was essentially saying they, they recognized, they recognized clearly that there was a commercial aspect to the, the fact that there was funds that were be, being received to run the home and, um, you know, the wages being paid and all that. But what they, what they really looked at was how the structure or how the, the home was being used 
And based on the nature of activities, they said that the facility functioned like a home. So this is the facts. I mean, the residents shared bedrooms, but had their own beds and dressers. They shared the common areas of the house and the household chores. They ate together family style with the children helping prepare meals. All the children attended the same public school and were assigned a staff advocate to act as their surrogate parent. The children were permanent residents of the W Manor until they reached 21 or were able to fend for themselves and be self-sufficient. They were supervised 24 hours a day. So essentially the residents function in the home was much like residents in any other home. So that's what they really looked at in terms of the residential use, not the fact uh, that they were some um, unrelated family members or related or unrelated family members. They looked at how they used the structure and they found they used it like a home. Um, and then public policy, I didn't put that up there, but that really supported the court's decision as well. There was a long line of legislative history under which developmental, developmentally disabled um, individuals and others with special needs were um, deemed to, should be able to live in homes with residential surroundings. So that kind of supported as well, and that was listed as the third reason why uh, Double D, uh, the group home could be in the community. Uh, and again, the fact that it was uh, uh, disabled individuals, disabled children is why I kept it in this, but I also wanted to show you how uh, a court will look at the, the language in the covenants and come to that conclusion, especially when there's public policy with respect to disabled uh, kids and adults. All right, next one. The case of a dog named Kane. This is an emotionally emotional support animal case. And in this case, there was a veteran, uh, hopefully I'm saying this right, Bogata, and he suffered from PTSD and acquired this dog named Kane. And so interestingly enough, he, he just got the dog. He didn't get, get the dog because his doctor said, hey, you should get an emotional support animal. He just acquired a dog. And then through having this dog, um, he found that his psychiatric symptoms were improving quite a bit because of Kane. And, um, you know, so he began to rely on the dog to help him manage his condition. Well, this particular association had a 25 pound dog weight limit. And so because of this, and after multiple discussions with his doctor, his physician, um, uh, he, he provided these two letters from his psychiatrist explaining his condition and his need for this emotional support animal and explaining that, you know, this is a therapeutic relationship and this was actually in the psychiatrist statement that he provided. And in response, the association requested the exact nature of the condition and whether Kane had received specific training, why he needed a dog that weighed over 25 pounds. Um, so, so essentially, this is more a case about how many requests that the association made. But let's just step back. What we're talking about here, protected category is a disabled individual. But here, it's a disabled individual that is emotionally disabled. So let's, and what typically does the association have to do when a disabled individual requests some kind of accommodation like here, they want the dog, uh, if they're faced with this request. And you really have to think about a couple things. And let me jump to this next slide first, and then I'll come back to this fact pattern, what the court said. So here, and in any case, if an association is faced with a disabled person that requests some kind of accommodation, associations under the Fair Housing Act must provide what's called a reasonable accommodation to disabled individuals if needed to afford the individual equal use and enjoyment in the unit or the community as a whole. So that means three questions that you have to always ask. Was the individual disabled? Does the individual need an accommodation in order to have equal use and an enjoyment in the unit or community? And is the actual requested accommodation reasonable? So let's look at each one of those. What is a disability? That's the first question. So there's this um, joint statement by HUD and the Department of Justice that is a fantastic resource that lays out everything you have to know about 
uh, reasonable accommodations under the Fair Housing Act. It gives you a lot of uh, frequently asked questions and scenarios and, and various samples. And that's one of the resources I will send you after the webinar. But first of all, what's a disability? And this is these are the terms <coughs> that are laid out in the Fair Housing Act and that are also in that joint statement. It's a physical or mental impairment which substantially limits one or more major life activities, a record of an impairment, or being regarded as having such an impairment. So you should know that um, physical or mental impairment is, excuse me, defined very broadly. And I'll give you some examples, and this is what's laid out in that statement. It includes orthopedic, visual, speech, and hearing impairments, um, cerebral palsy, autism, epilepsy, muscular dystrophy, uh, multiple sclerosis, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, HIV infection, mental retardation, emotional illness, drug addiction other than addiction caused by current illegal use of a controlled substance, and alcoholism. So it's pretty broad. Um, and so, but it has to also substantially limit one or more major life activities. And that's also broadly construed. And it includes caring for oneself, performing manual tasks, walking, seeing, hearing, speaking, breathing, learning, and working. So uh, just realize what way, if you, if you take a look at the statement that I'll send, it gives examples of, of various types of disabilities and, and how uh, the HUD, when it's enforcing these cases, is gonna look at each one and what they're, what they're really looking at. So definitely look at that statement. I did wanna point out uh, being regarded as having an impairment because we don't typically talk about that one. We're usually focused on the first one, but being regarded, uh, this, there, there was a case that came up where, which discussed this and it had to do with a drug slash alcohol rehabilitation group. Um, that was denied occupancy. And it wasn't an association. I think it might've been some kind of apartment complex or something. But the courts in that case said that people who are, quote, perceived as being drug users or addicts do fall under the def definition of disabled under the act. If they can demonstrate that they are regarded as having an impairment and if uh, and that they are not currently using drugs. So that was a big key different differentiating factor is that they can't be currently using the drugs. Okay, so that's what a disability is. So what's a reasonable accommodation or an accommodation? So an accommodation is essentially just an exception to a rule or a regulation or practice or covenant. And the exception in, in this case would be something that's necessary to provide the disabled person equal use and enjoyment of the unit or the community. So as a, a simple example, if you have a blind person that uh, moves into a community that has a no dog rule or a no pet rule, and that blind person needs a seeing eye dog, to be able to get around his or her unit or around the community, then you're, you know, you're required to provide that accommodation. It's reasonable because he needs that dog to be able to get around the community. So the trouble, and we're, we are getting back to the dog named Kane and the ESA animals, uh, emotional support animals, but the trouble with ESAs is that the disability is not obvious because such as in this case, PTSD, or maybe there's severe anxiety or some other kind of um, mental issue, and you don't see it. You don't necessarily see it when a person comes up and says, hey, I need an emotional support animal. So there might be some skepticism. Um, and you know, it's not like you have a person in a wheelchair where you can clearly see they need the wheelchair because of their multiple disability. So that's where this third question comes in. Can you ask for verification if you're not sure? Well, yes. So in cases of non-obvious or non-apparent disabilities, you can ask for verification, which you can then put in your file if somebody else wonders, you know, why did the heck did you allow them to have a dog and I can't have a dog? You can ask for verification. And, but this is, it, it's limited. So this is where associations sometimes get in trouble as they go, kind of go overboard. So what the association can do is they can request info that is necessary to verify that the person meets the definition of a disability 
and describes the needed accommodation and shows the relationship between the person's disability and the need for the requested accommodation. So, you know, I mean, who, one of the questions that sometimes comes up is who can provide this type of verification? Does it have to be a doctor, for example? And here's another um, plug for that statement that kind of goes into all the various people that could provide this, this verification. And I'll name a couple. What it said was a doctor or other medical professional, even a peer support group, a non-medical service agency. Um, and it says a reliable third party, but doesn't really say what that means. Um, and, in, and in most cases, what the, the statement says is medical, actual medical rec records aren't necessary to prove that there's a disability. But if you can get the statement from one of those groups or people, then that should be enough. So then the next step is, um, you know, once you verify that the person is disabled, is the accommodation needed? And is it reasonable? You know, that's the other thing, but usually it's, it's reasonable. It's usually just, we need the dog. But is it needed? Because there has to be some kind of relationship with the person's disability and the need for the request accommodation. Um, and in one case that I saw, Kennedy House, the disabled individual's doctor said that, um, you know, they described the dis disability as some kind of mobile, mobile related, so mobility related disability. Everything that, that, that was in the statement had to do with, with this uh, lady's mobility related needs. And this lady wanted a dog and there was nothing to tie why she needed a dog uh, because of her mobile mobility uh, related disability. Not to say that that can't be, not, can't happen. I mean, we have, you could have a, a person that is in a wheelchair and maybe needs a dog to pull the wheelchair. You know what I mean? So there could be those scenarios, but in this case, there was no, um, there was no relationship between what was requested and uh, the actual disability. Okay, so let's go back now and talk about the actual case and what happened. So again, we have this person that who has PTSD, and um, you know the doctor did everything right. So what this uh, what this uh, Mr. Bogeta did was he went to the doctor. He knew that he needed to provide some kind of statement that showed that he was disabled, that he needed cane for the disability to help him have equal use and enjoyment. Um, and uh, there was all these um, statements from the doctor as well saying he de this definitely helps with his disability. Um, it helps him cope with it. It alleviates some of his difficulties. It allows him to live independently and more fully use and enjoy the unit. So all the magic words were used. There was a lot of information that was provided, but then the association's requests and continued requests over several months. There were 19 questions in all, and um, I was gonna, I forgot to bring the actual case, but the questions were, were terrible. I mean, they were like, at what time of the day do you need the, how is the dog trained? At what time of the day do you use a dog for X? How many times do you use the dog for rehabilitation? Um, why do you need a 25 pound dog? Uh, so it was, there were, there were 19 questions in all over several months. And, you know, of course, he sued the association and the court said it found in his favor and said by persisting in its intrusive request for more and largely irrelevant information, the association constructively denied his request for a, an emotional support animal because they were saying we were going to we were going to grant it, but we just needed this information. So the lesson is once you've obtained that information that says that shows that the person is disabled and shows that the accommodation is needed for the disability then stop there the next step is only you know stop asking more questions just figure out whether the accommodation requested is reasonable i just wanted to really quickly say a couple of the fines that i found in several cases um, one was a fifty thousand dollar fine uh, i think this one was a $16,000 fine for uh, failure to, to grant the ESA. And there was one case in New York, which was 125,000. And in all of these cases, the associations were going far beyond what they should have asked. So much to the point that, that the person moved out and was like, I can't 
you know, I can't live here and I can't respond to everything, but they've caused me even more stress and everything. So just, just be wary of that. And if you're, if you're not sure, you need to talk to your attorney about this because um, they obviously not just uh, the HUD cases, but the CCRD as well, the Colorado Civil Rights uh, Division is also going to be looking at these and scrutinizing these pretty, uh, pretty heavily. All right. So let's move on. Next one, the case of the exclusive parking space. <coughs> so this, I don't, this is a New Jersey association. And um, I think I've, I've had a lot of associations say, do we need to give an exclusive parking space to somebody who's disabled and needs the, the closer exclusive parking space to, to assist? And, and, and nine times out of 10 or 99% of the time, it's going to be yes. So here, Mr. Gittleman suffered some kind of disability and requested you, uh, exclusive use of a parking space to accommodate the disability. And I'm assuming it's some kind of mobility dis disability, but didn't really say in the, in the cases. Um, and I don't think that the fact that he was disabled was disputed. But here, the, the association rejected his request. This, it makes it different because in this case, it, an association was trying to comply and they said, we, we, we did, we, we tried to do something. We tried to provide the space, but it wasn't within our authority to do so because the master deed, which is like the covenants, said that parking spaces within the community shall constitute common elements for the non-exclusive use of unit owners. And in order to uh, transfer that space over to Mr. Gittleman, uh, they would have to amend the declaration, or not amend the declaration, but get the owner's approval to transfer that space. So here the association was trying to, and what they did was they, 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 they said that, they argued that they tried to and they couldn't. They didn't have the authority to do it. Um, the board was, Usually when, again, when, when you have a, an HOA that can that is being faced with a question of whether to provide a reasonable accommodation, all they usually have to do is say yes, and then provide that exception to the rule. So most of the time it's just, please don't enforce this rule against me, a disabled person. So it's an exception. Here it's not just, a, it's not an exception. It is a, we, we don't have authority to do it without owner approval. So, um, so essentially, the, or the association argued that they were powerless to grant it because they did. They went, they tried to get the, um, they tried to amend that out, and they also tried to get a transfer, and it, neither of those uh, passed. So they couldn't get the owner approval. So they said, well, we tried, we failed, and our, our duty is done. So the court said no. The court disagreed and held that under the Fair Housing Act, the association is duty bound to avoid enforcing provisions of that master deed that have discriminatory effects. So it's not just an exception of a rule when you're giving that reasonable accommodation, you also have to avoid enforcing provisions that have discriminatory effects. And that the, they also said that you have to regulate the use of the common elements so as to comply with the requirements of the Fair Housing Act. So it sort of went beyond just granting an exception. It's it's Ignore the things that won't allow for the um, for compliance with the Fair Housing Act. And they also said, this is an interesting quote, the association cannot seek to avoid liability under the FHA by using the terms of the master deed as a shield. So you can't say we're powerless to grant the request. That's essentially what Gittleman says. And that is our um, another protected category, disability. Okay, we have a couple more. Six, the case for adding a sunroom. Um, this is again, another disability case. And uh, in this case, the plaintiffs had uh, made a number of requests to the ARC to add a sunroom because they had uh, disabled children. So they had two children, they both had Down syndrome. And one of them was prone to these spontaneous outbursts and injurious, self-injurious, actions and attacks, you know, against themselves. And the other one had severe hearing and vision impairment. And so it wasn't disputed that they were disabled. The question here was whether the owners should be able to add a sunroom so that the kids could enjoy the therapeutic benefits of sunlight. So this is not a reasonable accommodation. This is a reasonable modification. We want to add something, we want to change something. So I'll come back to this, but 
It's the same analysis as a reasonable accommodation, but in this case, you're looking at whether disabled and whether the individual needs the modification, the change the, um, of the structure in order to have equal use and enjoyment and is the requested modification reasonable. A real simple example would be if you had a townhome community and uh, a person who was mobility impaired needed a wheelchair ramp to enter their unit from the front of the home and typically ramp would not be allowed, but in this case, because they need it in order to access their home, you know, they then it must be approved by the association. And the only difference between this and, and the um, accommodation is that here, if there's costs involved, which there usually is because it is uh, a modification, then that cost is borne by the owner or the person that's requesting the, the modification, not by the association. If there's costs involved, with respect to an accommodation, then it's the association that's on the hook, but usually there aren't any costs that are involved with an accommodation. It's usually an exception to a rule. So here, um, let's go back. It's sort of the same thing as with the Gittleman case, where, uh, again, the Hollis's did everything right. They got the pediatric cardiologist to state that the kids would benefit from this particularized living environment. Um, they, he said that, that it would therapeutically stimulate their development, said all the right things, said they were disabled, said they needed this modification and all that good stuff. So the issue really was, again, the multiple separate applications and multiple requests and conditions that the ARC imposed on the, on the policies. They were first denied because of the aesthetics, then they were denied, they were asked to use brick or stone exterior rather than the siding. Then they were, then the Hollis has said, you know what, fine, we'll, we'll do that. And I'm summarizing here. It was a little bit more persnickety than that. But um, then the Hollis has proposed to build an exact replica of another home, another ARC member's uh, sunroom. And that was also denied. Um, then it all became about shing shingle roofs versus metal roof. So it was just on and on and on. And eventually they moved out and they said they were felt that they were forced to move out because of all this. And the court agreed. Um, and essentially was saying, you know, all this stuff, and they did use the word persnickety. I, know, I don't usually use that term. They, they were persnickety and, and they, the, the ARC was fastidious um, as to its design preferences, but it was, it was on and on and on and on. And they held for the, for the plaintiffs, the Hollises. And this particular case, the damages against the association was $156,000 against Chestnut Bend. So, um, you know, Again, they can come with some hefty, hefty fines. So, and again, when you have these uh, reasonable accommodation or modification requests, then you need to speed it up. You need to be timely in your responses. You need to look at it in terms of, well, what, what, uh, try to scrutinize it differently than, than the typical requests. Because if there's a gazillion, um, um, back and forth, uh, requests, and this might be seen as a, unintended, but it might be seen as a discriminatory effect against the disabled individual. Okay, finally, and there's also um, a joint statement by HUD and the Department of Justice on reasonable modifications under the Fair Housing Act as well. And so um, that is also available online and we can get that to you as well. So finally, case number seven, the case of the mezuzah. And this is Block versus for Shoals and Shoreline Towers. Um, I don't remember where exactly the association was, but um, these condo residents sued the association and its president under the Fair Housing Act because the mezuzah, which is a religious symbol, um, that for, uh, for, for uh, a religious Jewish symbol, uh, for not allowing them to place the mezuzah on their unit's doorpost. And what was happening was they would remove the, the mezuzah uh, because of a rule that was adopted by the condo, condo association. The rule said there shall not be any objects of any sort um, uh, pro are prohibited outside the unit entrance doors. So uh, so there's there's some facts you need to hear about this one because at first you, you'll think, well, wait a minute, you know, is this about, well, this isn't about, well, this is about religion and this is about race. Um, but for you should know that for years, the association didn't touch the mezuzah, 
or any other object outside of the unit doors or the door posts. I mean, they were, there was just a few exceptions of pictures, and this is funny, they, they took down pictures depicting uh, a swastika, a marijuana plant, and the Playboy Bunny. So that's the only time for several years that they actually enforced this rule. They were really looking more about junk in the hallway because these were you know, condo associations with the doors facing the indoors or the hallways and there was a bunch of junk. And so they would uniformly enforce with respect to all the junk, but they would leave the doors alone except for those exceptions. So it wasn't until they renovated the hallways <coughs> and there was a new president that they asked everybody to remove everything from their door. So the blocks did and they took off the mezuzah. And once the, um, the renovation was done, they replaced it, they put it back up. Um, so once the work was done, then they put it back up, but then the association took it down. And so they're like, well, wait a minute, they've never taken it down before, why are they taking it down now? Key also is that the association also took down a lot of other things now. So all of a sudden now they're, they're enforcing this rule and they took down crucifixes, wreaths, Christmas ornaments, political posters, and Chicago Bears pennants. So, so this must be in Chicago. Um, so initially this looks like the blocks were asking for an exception to the hallway rule based on the religion. But the Fair Housing Act doesn't require exceptions to rules that are facially neutral unless it's based on disability. So the reasonable accommodation is only for disabilities, not for all the other protected categories. So we're thinking, well, what, what is this? Why is this different here? Well, it's not really different here. What happened here was the case really came down to intentional discrimination. Um, there was a lot of evidence that this particular president um, had anti-Semitic motives. Um, he was he had a complete, utter intolerance of any kind of religious obligations that the blocks um, observed and was scheduling meetings um, during times where the blocks or uh, Mrs. Block couldn't attend. Um, what the, probably the biggest thing was, no, this is the biggest thing, was during uh, the most egregious action that which probably uh, justified or prompted the court to act the way it did was that Mrs. Block's husband passed away. And uh, when, the, when her husband passed away, uh, the president, again, this is Frischold, repeatedly ordered staff to take down the mezuzah during Shiva, which is uh, some kind of Jewish period of mourning. So repeatedly throughout this, I think it's seven days period of mourning, he would tell the staff to take it down. And so the Mrs. Block, uh, uh, first of all, she's you know already stressed out and and um, suffering because of the death of, death of her husband, um, was humiliated because every time the rabbi would come back to the the house, there would be no mezuzah, and and the thing is, the the association allowed for a table to be put out there with some water so that they could wash their hands before they came into the to the house after church or or what have you, and they allowed all this other stuff. But the president kept asking them to, kept telling the staff to take down the mezuzah every time they left. And when they came back, it, it continued. So it's clear that it was intentional discrimination and the court said there was enough proof for intentional discrimination. So I, they sent it back to the lower courts. This was really more about a motion for summary judgment. So they sent it back and that's what happened in the case of the mezuzah. I bring up the mezuzah because um, for those of you who don't know, last year, 2020, um, one of the bills that was passed and signed into law was in Kiowa. And it, same thing happened in this Chicago case where um, statutory, provision, statutory provisions were added to their Condo Act. Essentially, the association shall not prohibit any of the following, and one of those following is now, the display of religious symbols or items on the entry door or entry door frame of a unit. Now, there are some... Um, limitations on size and all of that. Uh, so, but just know that it is statutorily required now, uh, no that the association can't, it's essentially a, an exception to any kind of rules on the entry door or door frame. All right, we're at the, at the end here and then I'll open it up to questions. <coughs> so practice pointers, 
we went over seven cases again, but there's tons of other examples. And please take a look at the, the articles that I send because you'll see some of these other examples and I'm sure they'll come up. But number one, probably the big one is adopt a reasonable accommodation or modification policy. This is a policy that will uh, pretty much give you the instructions of what you should do as an association if you are faced with somebody who is requesting an exception to a rule or regulation based on their disability. And it, it lays out everything that I just discussed um, in this program. Uh, what's a disability, well, you know, what you're supposed to analyze first, what are those three questions, what's a disability, you know, um, what, whether it's a disability, whether the accommodation is needed to address the disability, and whether the accommodation or modification is reasonable. Um, it also discusses things about verification and, and all of that. So it really, really, really helps um, associations know how to act and also how to act uniformly. So because if you have this policy, then you'll just Follow it, instruction number one, two, three, four, five. Review your restrictions, rules, and regs for discriminatory language. You know, in some cases, the association didn't even know that they were being discriminatory. They thought it was okay to say no tricycles or no playing on the common area. Or there was a rule that seemed facially neutral, um, like um, no one under 18. Uh, can use the pool, but it's really discriminating against families with children. Review those rules and regs and with your attorney and consult your attorney if you ever have a question you're not sure how to proceed. Definitely consult your attorney, um, it, whether you're skeptical about something or whether you're not sure how to address a discrimination question. Enforce in a uniform and consistent manner. That's probably the number one claim against association boards is they're not acting in a uniform or consistent manner. So they're discriminating in some way. So you need to have some kind of um, um, clear uh, uh, paper trail showing that we're, we're, we're treating everybody the same. Uh, we're not just enforcing against this particular category of people. Engage the individual seeking an accommodation modification in an interactive dialogue. <clears throat> so a lot of the things you saw was um, in a couple of the cases, the Gittleman case and the, the Sunroom case, had to do with the, the association failing to respond in a timely manner. And then when they did, it was just these, you know, they drop a bunch of questions. And it wasn't really this interactive dialogue and it wasn't showing that they even opened a dialogue it was just more of a we wait for three months we wait for six months and then all of a sudden we get this request for all this information that's a no-no they're going to be scrutinizing for that and just by failing to act in a timely manner it's going to cause uh, the CCRD or the courts to say you know you're you're sort of con constructively discriminating against them you're not directly doing it but your actions are going to be seen as discrimination uh, be professional, you know, I mean, that's obvious. And if your association is faced <coughs> with a discrimination complaint, these are obvious as well. Be civil, but sometimes it's hard, especially when you're not sure whether the person is trying to game the system. I mean, that's what I always hear from for ESA cases. Are they really just trying, are they really disabled? Um, or are they just trying to game the system or are they, you know? So just be civil, no matter what. Just, just don't strike back at the person who filed the complaint. Don't ask them why they filed it or the substance, substance of it. Just continue with the process. Just follow the process. Just comply with the process. And, and one of the articles I'm going to send you will link you to the process that occurs in the CCRD so you'll kind of know the behind the scenes. Just take it seriously. Um, be responsive uh, and provide information. So if it comes on our desk, the CCRD complaint, we're gonna ask you for a lot of information and you should be gathering that information and getting to us as quickly as possible. Because most of the time, what's gonna happen um, is that there's gonna, they're, they're gonna find that there's no discrimination, there's no cause moving forward because of one of the factors isn't present. Um, so to the extent that you can get that information to the attorney quickly, um, that would be good. And then finally, keep good records. Um, associations with well-documented procedures can demonstrate, can show that investigators that there was no discrimination that occurred. So paper trail is always a good thing for any kind of action of the association, but really in this action here. And it starts with that reasonable accommodation modification policy. All right, so I got through all that. Let's talk about, see some of these questions. What, let me, should I get this here so I don't mess this up like I did before? Um, okay. 
see. I can't hear you was the first one. Hopefully you can hear me and I spoke up there. If the board is violating owners for having kids toys on their patios, would that constitute discrimination? No, not necessarily. If there is something that says no whatever and names all these objects and they're not complying with the patio um, uh, rule regarding what can be on the patio, as long as the, the rule itself is say, doesn't say no toys on the patio, but all this other stuff can be on the patio, but no toys. If it just says no toys, and that would have the underlying effect of discriminating against family with children. But if it's no, this, 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 and this, junky furniture, bicycles, whatever, and toys happen to be one of them, then that's not discriminating. Is there a limit to the type of animals that qualifies under ESAs? Um, not under ESAs. So there is under ADA, which um, is sometimes a, a, a question, and that's very different from emotional support animals. ADA um, is the American Disabilities with Act and often doesn't apply to associations because it only applies to places of public accommodation, which are you know where, where the general public is allowed into the community. But for ESAs, there's no specific list of types of animals or um, chickens, yeah, ESA, there, there has been an emotional support chicken. What they need to show is they need that chicken um, in order to accommodate their disability and to allow them equal use and enjoyment. Now, it might come down, though, to uh, not the type of animal as a limitation, but it could be that the, the requested accommodation is not reasonable, which is different. So you're living in a condo. Is it reasonable to have a rooster <laughs> that's coming and crowing every morning or is it reasonable to have a bengal tiger in your condo unit or something so so it, it's probably not going to be reasonable uh but there's no stated limitation of the types of animals that i know of is it discriminatory in the case of the essays you can still find for violations of the rules like barking dogs etc yeah i mean the, the the accommodation is to allow the the animal so it's not just a dog, but to allow the animal. The tenant or the owner is still uh, required to comply with other rules and regulations, and the accommodation still has to be reasonable. So again, when it comes to a particular dog that's, for example, vicious and is biting everybody, is that reasonable? Is that reasonable for them to be biting all these other unit owners or other you know animals? No. So oftentimes it, it's a factual situation. So they're still um, subject to the other rules and regulations, but you it's kind of tricky because um, you still have to provide the accommodation and there, there's a different light that's looked on to the types of violations uh, and whether it's unreasonable to ask the owner, the tenant to to still comply with this other regulation. So I'm going to say it depends. <laughs> I'll just say that. But if you want to get me off on offline we can talk about that more specifically what about the removal of an accommodation such as a ramp or the sunroom or the removal of an, a modification can the hoa require these modifications be removed at the homeowner's expense when they leave the hoa it's a great question the answer is no um so that's it's interesting and this is in the uh, joint statement of HUD and DOJ in their FAQs of reasonable modifications under the FHA. The association has to approve it if they satisfy, you know, the criteria, and but it's at the owner's cost to install the modification, and the association can't require that they remove it when they leave. So the association, if they want it to be removed, they're going to have to uh, pay for it themselves. And this is applicable to both interior and exterior. So if they request that modification to the common areas, for example, and, and they leave, they can't tell the homeowner who put the modification in to take it out. If the association wants to take it out, then the association has to pay for that, that removal. So what age is dis defensible for pool rules? 14 or should it be 12? So I understand 14 is a defensible age and I haven't found anything in the in any kind of CCRD or regulations, but that's what I understand and from previous uh, dialogue and 
communications on other cases that we've had with the CR CCRD that 14, anything under 14 is okay. Um, and again, we at least we have at least one California case, and I think there was a New York case that said the same, and it was tied to, um, again, the, the building construction code that used the same uh, age. So I think under 14 would be okay. Uh, this one is, for example, HOA president declarant requires a female unit owner who owns the property in a trust to submit all estate planning documents to prove status as trustee. Prior male trustee owner held property in the same trust, not required to submit any documentation. Same declarant appoints male boards. Okay, well, well when you're looking at how people are treated differently and if it's based on one of the categories in here, sex, female or male, then and you can show that um, they're clearly being treated differently, then that's probably going to rise to the potential level of a uh, CCRD complaint. Um, obviously, I can't speak to this particular association or what the underlying facts are, but if it's treating individuals who are in a protected category differently than everyone else, based on one of those categories, race, gender, sex, um, I said sex, but I meant gender, um, national origin and all the familial status and handicap, then it's probably gonna raise, uh, be raised to the, to the level of a discrimination violation. And um, to the extent that there's this pattern and you can show it, then you know it's probably discrimination. Again, I'm not gonna, <laughs> I don't know, I can't speak to that specifically. In a duplex, a handicap owner is requesting to enclose their patio. <clears throat> Our rules do not allow any additions, expansions, or patio enclosures. Does this fall under the FHA where it would be allowed? So it's going to depend. So again, the exception, the rule here is no additions, expansions, or patio enclosures. That's what the rule or the deck provision says. But if this handicapped owner needs the enclosure of their patio in order to have equal use and enjoyment of the community or a unit, then you're gonna have to allow them to modify their patio because of this, to grant them a reasonable modification. I don't know what that is. I mean, why they would need it. Um, what you need to do is ask them, you know, is this a, your, your, to, to provide documentation or something saying, you know, first of all, they're handicapped, but I don't, I don't know if this is an obvious disability or not, but if it's not an obvious disability, you can ask for verification that they're actually disabled. And once you get that verification, that verification should actually also say whether the requested accommodation enclosure is needed for that disability. If it's not, and there's no direct relationship, then that already kicks it out of the need to provide the reasonable modification. But you can't get there without asking those three questions. Is there a disability? Is it is accommodation or modification necessary to give them equal use and enjoyment? And is the request reasonable? Finally, covenants limit the number of dogs to two. The owner has four dogs and claims that all four are needed for support. Is there a limit to the number of support animals? No, there's no limit that I've seen either. But again, each one of those animals, take them out of of um, dogs where there's a says covenants li limit the number of dogs emotional support animals aren't treated the same way as pets or you know uh, dogs they're, they're emotional support animals each one of those animals needs to be able to um, meet the criteria that uh, that, uh, um, that we discussed before so here they could have two dogs because the covenants allow two dogs but the other two dogs have that are over the limit. I mean, uh, the other two dogs have to meet, they have to both be required to accommodate or to help the disabled person have an equal use or an enjoyment of the community. So both of them have to do this. Um, they don't just have to prove it for one dog. They have to prove it for any animal that would be in violation of the declaration 
if they weren't disabled. So maybe one dog has to alert them to um, somebody at the door. Maybe somebody is, is deaf and they need or them to alert them to the door. Maybe another dog is necessary to bring something to them. So they, there's no limit. Um, but again, they have to they have to show for every single dog or every single animal. Sorry. I think that's it. Is that it? Yes, it is. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining me. Um, I'm only 10 minutes sober. I'm usually the one that goes over 20 minutes or 30 minutes. So thank you so much for joining me. Please don't forget to um, sign up for our next webinar. It was all, all about the 2021 uh, pool issue and vaccines and COVID and what do you do? Is it status quo? Do you open the pool? Do you not open the pool? Um, and there's, there's potentially uh, claims of discrimination if you uh, – open the pool only to people who have been vaccinated. So, so those, all those questions are going to be answered or at least discussed in the next webinar by Alina. And so be sure to join in for that and be sure to get on our website for all the other great resources that we have. And in the next uh, day or so, I'm going to send you those resources, hopefully today, but maybe tomorrow. Um, what I'm going to send you is the joint statement for reasonable, uh, accommodations and modifications. I'm going to send you a, an overview, an article, sort of a green folder article that discusses an overview of everything that I've talked about. And uh, what was the last thing I was going to send you? I can't remember. There's something else I was going to send you. But thank you again, everybody. Have a great rest of your week, and I'll see you at the next webinar.